This is when the creed that we say, and that we call the Nicene Creed, creed was, uh, was confirmed. The creed itself that we now say, it's very similar to the, Nicene, to the creed that was drafted up at Nicene, at Nicaea, but there is, there's some differences. Um, and this, the creed that we drew up, that we say, was probably drawn up in 362 at the Council of Alexandria. It was probably a baptismal um, symbol that uh, was, was, a, was a, it, it adopted by the fathers of the Second Ecumenical Council um, as, um, as, as a, as a uh, suitable uh, creed for the whole church. Um, but even so, this creed that was put forth, or that was accepted by the Second that was formulated, was confirmed by the fathers of the Second Ecumenical Council, um, it did not really, uh, it was not well known. And um, it was kind of, I wouldn't say that it was forgotten, but not everybody knew about it until at the Fourth Ecumenical Council in 451, at one of the early sessions of that council, they drew out they drew out of the archives the creed that had been drafted at Nicaea and the creed that had been this creed that had been confirmed by the fathers of the of the Second Ecumenical Council. And a lot of a lot of the fathers said, Well, where did that come from? We'd never seen that. Um, but it was established as at the Council of Chalcedon, that creed, which we now say, and which we call the Nicene Creed. And it's very similar to the Nicene Creed. But that creed now, it was established at the Council of Chalcedon as the creed of the church. That, uh, you, that, that you, one, should, one, should, one may not add to it, nor may one subtract from it. It became the official symbol of the Christian faith. Um, the Third Ecumenical Council was at Ephesus in the 431. This was the principles that this council would be St. Cyril of Alexandria. He died in 444, whatever that's worth. Um, Nestorius, who was the patriarch of Constantinople. And St. John of Antioch. The issue here was the term, what was this, was what to call Mary the Virgin. Nestorius did not want to call her Theotokos because he couldn't understand, he, he felt that it was, in, it was um, unbecoming, it was, it was simply wrong to uh, ascribe to God a beginning in the flesh. How can God, God is unchangeable, he's immutable, he's from eternity. We just established, did we not, that the Logos is fully God, he's not a creature. So how can you say that the Logos, you know, the word of God, is fully God? How can you say that he was born of a woman? You can't, it's just, it's, 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 it's improper, it's unsuitable, um, unbecoming to God. So he, would, he was willing to say that, um, that what was formed in Mary's womb um, was what well, was a human? You know, it almost sounds like the abortionists of today. You know, kind of this mat, this lump of flesh that was that was formed in Mary's womb, and that the Lord kind of kind of took over. But it wasn't the Lord who was born. It wasn't the Logos who was born. It was it was this this human nature that was born uh, as a temple. So that even in the womb, he would he was able to go so far as to say that even in the womb of the Virgin, um, the divine logos indwelt this this human nature as in a temple, but it wasn't the logos who was born; it was the human nature that was born. So um, Nestorius could say would say that there was there was one Christ, but you know he was he was not a he was not a sophisticated theologian, and he was. He was not. His mind wasn't. His mind wasn't a, a razor sharp like it, like it needed to be. Uh, he couldn't see that what that 
that his Christ was basically a, a show, an ontic show that housed two subjects. Um, the one subject, the human nature, which is called Jesus. The other subject, uh, the divine word of God. So, th so for that reason, he was able to say, uh, Christotokos, the virgin is Christotokos, uh, but not Theotokos. You just cannot say Theotokos. Um, so he was contested by St. Cyril of Alexandria. There's some politics going on here too, uh, between Constantinople, Rome, and, uh, and, uh, and Alexandria. Constantinople and Alexandria. Um, but um, um, and underneath it all um, is, is the issue of the Virgin Mary, whether she's Theotokos, or whether we can call her properly Theotokos, or Christotokos. Theotokos means birth giver of God, the bearer of God. Um, we, it does not technically mean mother of God. That would be Mater Theu. However, it, the Virgin Mary was God's mother. So to translate Theopokos as the mother of God is, is thoroughly biblical. Um, St. Elizabeth, does she not say when the Virgin comes um, after she has just comes to Elizabeth's house, uh, just after she has conceived of, uh, the Christ, doesn't Elizabeth say, how is it that the mother of my Lord yeah. should come to me? Um, the, the wedding at Cana of Galilee, uh, St. John says, the mother of Jesus was there with him. You know, so I mean, um, I'm, I'm saying this, perhaps I don't need to, but I'm saying this because I just read somebody who's kind of going off on uh, calling Mary, uh, translating Theotokos as mother of God, kind of getting hung up, in my opinion, on the fact that Theotokos means birth giver of God, not mother of God, and I'm kind of saying to myself, who oh, me? Um, the scriptures are clear that the Theotokos was the mother of Jesus. But the, the, uh, the issue is, the question is, um, on what grounds can we call virgin, the Virgin Mary Theotokos? And when we do call her Theotokos, um, is it a statement about Mary? Or is it a statement about her son? You know, who, what's, what's the confession? Is it a confession of Mary as the, as, as the Mater Dei? Um, Theotokos, or is it a confession of her son? So what do you think? It's of her son. It's of her son. son is God. Your son is God. Yeah. So if he's, so if he's the one that's born of her, then obviously she is Theotokos. Right. But this is the issue that that those who were on the story of the side had with the, with the title of Theotokos. How can God be born of a virgin? They wanted to they wanted to uh, protect the full integrity of the human nature. And they, they felt that, they felt that if you called her Theotokos, which was a long-standing tradition, um, I, can't, I can't remember how far back it goes, but it goes way, way back. Um, if you called her Theotokos, in their mind, you were, you were either a crypto-Aryan, in other words, you were suggesting that Christ, that, that the one who was born of Mary was a, uh, was a, uh, no, what, how does it go? Yeah, that, uh, that he's a creature. That, that, that the divine Logos is a creature, and therefore he can be mutable, passable, and that's how he can be born of the Theotokos, of as Theotokos. Or you are falling into a Palinarianism, in which the Theotokos is, or in which the divine Logos is just wrapping around himself a flesh, um, and the flesh is kind of absorbed into the Logos, but then you're also suggesting that the Logos, that God himself is passable. I mean, so none of that is 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 okay. All of that is yes, Michael. Don't the historians don't they divide Christ into two persons, and Mary only gave birth to the human person, but the divine person. Well, yes, and they would work yeah. around that. They would work around that. Yeah. Uh, they would say that there was a sharing of persons. Although well, they would say they would, you know, in this at this in this day and age, at this time, all of these terms that are that are messing things up, they have not been well defined. And so the, the definition that we're working with is the definition that has been given to these terms from philosophy. Um, so, person, 
you know, as we said before, the Greek that the Latin persona is translating is prosopon, it means the same thing, it means a mask. Persona is a mask. So it's, an, so it's focusing on the external, what you see on the outside. And so the Christ clearly is one reality. Um, and that's the, that's the prosopon. But what you're seeing is the mask or the veil behind which are basically are in, 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 in effect two subjects. So because when Nestorius and his followers start talking about the Christ, um, they're clearly uh, lining up uh, the, all of the incidents in the Gospels into two rows. And this one, this row that it has to do with all the human, human acts of Christ, those are of the human nature that is called Jesus. And this line that has to do with his divine acts, those clearly are the, the acts of the divine logos. So for all their um, uh, protestations to the contrary, they are in they are in effect uh, teaching two subjects, whatever they want to call the Christ. They are teaching two subjects. It might be useful later on to note that Nestorius was the disciple of Theodore of Celestia, who was himself the disciple of Theodore of Tarsus. You read their works, um, the fragments that remain. Theodore of Tarsus, um, and it's clear that well, this, this whole Antiochian Eastern school is, is very much concerned to protect the full integrity of the human nature, and they, 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 they follow that to the point of maximizing, following Father Filosofy at this point, they maximize the human nature, um, so that um, the whole stress is on the humanity, it's on, it's on Jesus, it's on the human subject, and, uh, so, and, and, his, uh, and on his ascetical strivings to become um, the Savior. Um, so the, it, it follows from this, uh, it's consistent with this spiritual asceticism that seems to be typical of, of, the, of the Eastern part of the empire that lays the stress on, on, the, on human effort. Um, heroic uh, effort of the will. You just uh, you read the you read the Holy Father. You read the Desert Fathers, um, and you can see this uh, emphasis on on the on the will. Uh, not that we're not not that to, not that that's you know to suggest that we're not free. We are free, but the uh, is to that that we can it, it, that uh, uh, Cheryl and David will, will appreciate this. It, it is in effect. It is the same mindset as belief. You know that we can uh, we can gain our salvation by our own efforts. We just got to be really resolute and courageous and strong. But we fight through it. We can gain our salvation. So uh, salvation obviously would not be deification. It would not be theosis. It would not be union with God. It would be kind of God having uh, being pleased with you. And in fact, that's how they describe the union, the Nestorians. That's how they describe the union uh, of Christ. That the human subject Jesus was united with the divine word um, through good pleasure, or by the Father's good pleasure, because he was pleased with with how heroic and pure Jesus was. Yes, Matthew. So, <clears throat> is this one of the reasons why we see, for example, in the Syrian desert, we see the phenomenon of the stylites, who, of course, they were saints, right? But they had a very Peculiar mode of asceticism. You know, it's 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 weird, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. It could be. I don't know. John Chrysostom was Antiochian, so he was in this same school. But you read his writings carefully, and he is not Nestorian. So and, and Saint Ephraim of Syria, Saint Afrahat, also of Syria, Saint Romanus the Melodist. You know, he's from that. He's, he he hails from that region. Um, so. Uh, they're, they're, they're not in the story. So something else is going on. Um, now, kind of unconnected to this, years ago, I read a book by, I think it was Henry, Henry Frankfurt. Does that name ring a bell to anybody? 
the theology of kingship in the ancient Near East. And it was not, it was not a Christian work at all, it was, it was an anthropological study. And, but he was um, describing the theology of kingship in the Far East or in the, the area of Antioch and, and going into Syria, and then the theology of kingship that obtains in Alexandria, in the western part. And it was interesting to me to note that in the east, in the western part of the empire, the, the king, you know, in Egypt, the king is basically God incarnate. And in the east, the king is this man who is a mediator between the divine. I'm thinking, hmm, that looks an awful lot like Alexandrian and Antiochian Christology. So you wonder, you know, I, I mean, the, 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 the parallels, of the, you know, the, the similarities are so striking that it can't be accident, it can't be just by coincidence that we have a Christology in the Antiochian Syrian region that looks a whole lot like the theology of kingship that prevailed there, in, the same in Alexandria. Okay, were you going to say something about that? Well, I was also going to say, like, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure how this characterization from, like fits the entire of the Antiochian tradition because, like, I mean, reading Ephraim the Syrian or um, after the after the Persian, uh, they're not. They, I mean, they're not historians either. Yeah. I mean, they're they're definitely like, Ephraim is very insistent on. It's not God's good pleasure that saves. Yeah. It's it's God's mercy. You know, but yeah, you know, why not? Well, you know, this the imagery of, of the of the garment. How the logo clothes himself with the garment of humanity. That's that's Syrian. Yeah. That's a Syrian theme. And you see it in the Antiochians. You see it in Nestorius. You see it in John Chrysostom. Okay. Uh, but anyway, it has made its way into uh, Byzantine Christianity, the Orthodox Christianity, you know, through Constantinople. It went through the Council of Chalcedon, as we'll see, which is kind of the synthesis of the two of the two traditions. But the question, the issue is, well, that, that's beautiful imagery, and it's just fine. But the question is, that has not yet been dis defined here, is what does this garment include? And the Alexandrians might say, well, Apollinaris would say, well, it includes the flesh and the soul, but not the mind. Now, Nestorius, to the point that for, for Apollinaris, the Christ is basically a freak. He's not really human. Uh, but then how also can he suffer? He's God. So it tends also kind of towards a docetism. But also if you get rid of the mind, if, if he doesn't assume the mind, what is that saying about the mind? It's suggesting that the mind is inherently in conflict with God. Is that the nature of the human mind? Um, so then the mind cannot be saved. And it's also to suggest that if, that if you're going to be saved, it's a, it, it, one of its practical consequences would be, well, you've got to get rid of your mind. Or put your mind on the shelf. Or become an anti-intellectual. You know? So the mind is not transformed in a polinary Christology. It's basically gutted, you know, destroyed. Now, um, if you were to ask the question, the question let's say of St. Athanasius, who was in Alexandria, St. Cyril of Alexandria, all of these, 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 these giants of the Alexandrian tradition, if you were to ask them, well, what does that garment that Christ, that the Logos clothed himself with include, they would say, definitely, it includes the mind. And they would say that. They would say that, that he assumed, for, he assumed our human nature, and then they would uh, give a dig at Apollonaris, and they would add, which included a reasonable soul, in other words, a soul with the mind. But here's the thing, they, they were, that we are not at a point now where they can go on and describe, or you know, in, in precise philosophical terms, how that can be, which in itself is, is, is significant, and that's what I, one of the things I want to uh, talk about when we go back and start just walking through, um, look at it more closely. Um, what does it mean? What is, what is being said? What, what do you see when you, when you see the fathers holding on to a biblical um, presentation of Christ? as opposed to the ones who are later condemned as heretics who seem to be holding on to a biblical doctrine of Christ that is bound by philosophical concepts that are already established in their minds. All right, well, we're, we're kind of starting to dip. Let's go back up to 30,000.
10,000 feet. Um, St. John of Antioch is here because it was St. John of Antioch who, representing this Antiochian tradition, um, this Antiochian school of theology, um, who was able, who was not an historian, but he still, he tended to talk in, in, in Antiochian language, or language that was typical of Antiochian, but he was able to frame the Antiochian uh, Christology in such a way that it, it said the same thing that St. Cyril of Alexandria was saying. And so there was a, so that the Council of Ephesus was, um, was um, uh, sealed by the, you know, the, 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 con the reconciliation of Antioch and Alexandria in the persons of St. Cyril of Alexandria and St. John of Antioch. Um, St. Cyril of Alexandria had written 12 chapters, they're called, uh, 12 anathemas uh, uh, against the teaching of Nestorius. Uh, that Nestorius had to subscribe to if he was going to be restored to communion with the church and Nestorius would not subscribe to them but then for that matter neither would St. John of Antioch. But at the Council of Ephesus uh, with St. John's with St. Cyril's letter well, no, with St. John's letter to St. Cyril in which he described the um, Christology that, that, his, that he represented that, that he was baptized into um, there was, St. Cyril saw no need to press him to accept his 12 chapters against the stories. And so that was allowed to, um, to, to, to slip away. Uh, it, it didn't disappear at all. It's going to come back as another standard criterion of orthodoxy. But here at this council, St. Cyril saw no need to press St. John to accept them. And St. John did not bring them up either. So those 12 chapters were never signed. They were never agreed to by the Antiochian school. But it was at, it, it, the, the agreement was there. The reconciliation was there. As I say, those 12 chapters will come back. And I intend to read those 12 chapters or to print them out and show them to you when they go back through um, and do the, the walkthrough. But we're trying to do a flyover right now. So let's quickly then go to um, the fourth ecumenical council. And this would be... Uh, 451 in Chalcedon. This is when we have the, it's not a creed, it's a definition of faith. And this, uh, to read the history, the politics, and the, you know, the, the, uh, the connivings, and the, uh, the back, and the, uh, the backroom politics that are going on, it, it can be distressing. <laughs> This can be distressing, but there's something at stake here. And we'll, that's something I want to talk about also when we go back and walk through it. But it's at the Council of Chalcedon that the uh, schools, so-called schools of Antioch and Alexandria, both of which represent kind of, they, they represent tendencies which if allowed to go unchecked can, lie, can lead on the one hand to, you know, historianism, Christ is two subjects, or to a kind of an adoptionism, where Jesus, where Christ is the man uh, who's in a special relationship with God and enjoys a special grace by God, or the Alexandrian inclination, uh, if it's allowed to go unchecked, tends towards monophysitism, um, uh, in which the human nature is swallowed up into the divine nature. Um, so. The Council of Chalcedon um, was, you know, the, the issue there was um, a fellow by the name of Eutyches, who was uh, a, 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 an Archimandrite, you know, so he was a monastic, he was not a theologian. So he just follows the language of his predecessors, like, like a good monastic does. St. Athanasius, um, and the St. Cyril of Alexandria in particular, um, they had said one nature of God the Word incarnate. That was their formula. One nature of God the Word incarnate. St. Cyril of Alexandria adopted that formula, uh, thinking that it was written by St. Athanasius, but in fact it was, it was coined by Apollinaris. So that weakened St. Cyril's case that he was not an Apollinarian. Because they could point out, you're using a formula that was coined by Apollinaris. Um, 
So the, but he didn't mean what Apollinaris meant by that formula. One nature of God, the Word incarnate. If nature, he meant, you know, a reality, one reality of, of Christ, who is God the Word in the flesh. So anyway, that, and that formula is going to come back also. It's going to come back at the Fifth Ecumenical Council, and that's going to have to be, it's going to have to be, um, uh, you know, hammered out. Uh, but anyway, at, at the Council of Chalcedon, um, fresh off of the, um, the, uh, uh, the, let's see, it was the, uh, the Eutyches was was brought was hailed before a council, um, uh, which was uh, said to be an ecumenical council, um, and uh, the the presider of that council was the uh, nephew of Saint Cyril, Diostorus, um, who was of course um, uh, whose hero was his uncle Saint Cyril, um, and whose standard of orthodoxy was taken from the writings of St. Cyril. So uh, Eutyches also began to teach, following the language of St. Cyril, that Christ was God the Word, uh, one nature, that before the union of Christ and the human nature, there were, there were two natures. There was a human nature, there was a divine nature, but after the union there was only one nature, the divine. So that the human nature was swallowed up into the divine nature. Well, that looks like an Apollinarian Christology, except that Eutyches could say that there was a human mind. Um, if, if, he would even, if, if he would even go that far, I don't know that he even went that far in his theological analysis. He wasn't particularly capable of doing that. But this is, this is, when, this is thoroughgoing monophysitism. This is the beginning of genuine monophysitism that uh, starts with Eutyches, a kind of an extreme, extreme um, uh, minimalizing of, of the human nature to the point that it's absorbed completely into the, into the divine nature. But then the question is, is that really what Eutyches had in mind? Did, did he really understand that? I mean, because, again, language at this time, the terms at this time are, are not settled. They're not established. And people are trying to describe this mystery of Christ as they understand it, as they see it, using the terms that are at hand. And so, but the terms that are at hand, as I say, are taken from philosophy. And those terms carry a certain meaning from philosophy. So when they use these terms, whether or not they had something else in mind, and these were the only terms that were available that they could use in order to express what they had in mind, nonetheless, when they bring these terms in, they bring the meaning in with it. And so that meaning that those terms carry, how can it not but condition or shape their understanding of the Christ that they're talking about? So if nature is, if it means, uh, you know, um, essence, or if it even means a particular, a human particular, um, uh, then if you're going to, if that's what it means, you're going to bring it into Christology, and you want to assert that Christ is just one subject, well, you have a choice, do you not? Either the subject is going to be the divine logos, in which case, what are you going to do with the human nature, and especially what are you going to do with the human mind? Which at that time is going to be the center, the locus of the person. The subject, that's where the subject is rooted in the mind. Or you can go the other way, you can say that uh, the Christ is fully man, and he has a human mind, he has a human will. Well then, what are you going to do with the divine logos? How are you going to put the two together? There's no, there are no categories from philosophy that will allow you to do that. You know, the, the, the problem of the one and the many has been, there are, there are umpteen million schools of thought in, in ancient philosophy trying to figure out that riddle, the one and the many. And not a one of them is able to help you dealing with the mystery of Christ, God incarnate, in order to explain. And so what the fathers end up doing is they just end up asserting that Christ is one person, uh, or St. Cyril would say, one nature who includes, who, who, who assumed to himself the body that included flesh, soul, and mind. And the way they, they would try to explain themselves, they would say that this body that the Christ assumed, that the Logos assumed, was his own. In the same way that our body is our own. Um, so this is this is what's going on. You know, this, this is the 
this is the, the, the philosophical. These are the philosophical issues that are that are muddying the waters and making it difficult to come to a, a clear, articulate, a clear articulation of the of the church's confession. And you might be asking yourself, but, but why go why go to all that trouble in the first place? Why not just accept it as a mystery? Um, no, there are reasons why it's critical to to uh, find a, a, a precise a philosophical. Um, presentation of the mystery of, 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 of the Incarnation. There are reasons, and again, that's what I want to go through, go over when we go back and do our walkthrough. But so, with all of this, the Council of Chalcedon is like, it, it takes, it takes um, the, the, the unity of subject as the divine subject, as the divine logo from Alexandria, and it takes the, um, the, 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 the integrity, the full integrity of the human nature that was that, that the Antiochian school championed and puts those two together to come up with what is now the Chalcedonian definition of faith. Chalcedon was like a synthesis of these two uh, schools of thought, Antioch and Alexandria. And so now with, with Chalcedon, Alexandria and Antioch both begin to, um, in, in terms of their influence, uh, begin to decline. And now Constantinople, or Byzantine Christianity, uh, begins to rise as the, well, I'm not quite happy with how this, how it's called the synthesis of Alexandria and Antioch, but, um, you know, there's, you know, what are you going to do? I, I would look for a different word. I think simply, the, the word synthesis is too Hegelian, too much, it's too philosophical. I don't, I think there's more than a synthesis going on. But anyway, that's what it's called, and you get the idea. So the result was, well, this was this Hegelian thesis, <laughs> the Chalcedonian definition of faith. Wherefore, following the Holy Fathers, we all with one voice confess our Lord Jesus Christ, one and the same Son, and that's the key word, the key phrase, one and the same Son. Our Lord Jesus Christ is one and the same Son. He's not two sons. The Nestorians could not say this. One and the same. The same, the same one, perfect in Godhead. The same one, perfect in manhood. Truly God and truly man. The same one. Now it might be useful to remember at this point, or to learn at this point, some of you, some of you may not have even known this, but, you know, um, in, the, in, the, in the philosophical thought of the day, and perhaps even still today, there was no term to describe a personal being. No term. So, um, and in fact, in ancient philosophy, um, the idea that the person, you, each one of you, as you, cannot be known, not in the sense that I would say, because actually I would say you can be known, but in a way that's beyond knowing. But they would say, you cannot be known. The only thing that can be known is the universal. Because you are an unrepeatable instance of the essence in that particular space-time, the coordinate of space-time. And once you dissolve, well, you're, you're gone. You go back into the essence. You are gone. So the only way I can know you is by knowing the essence that you belong to. So, you know, you can hear the fathers. Again, they're... they're what I think is what I think is is, is is remarkable is how they are not allowing themselves to be shackled by philosophical categories, and they're trying to find language that will express, like how would I like to say, something completely different. So they say the same perfect in Godhead, the same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, the same consisting of a reasonable soul and a body. That's against Apollinarianism. Of one substance with the Father as touching the Godhead, that's against Arianism. The same of one substance with us as touching the manhood, that's against Apollinarianism again. Like us in all things apart from sin. Begotten of the Father before the ages as touching the Godhead. The same in the last days. In other words, he didn't take to himself someone else, another subject. He himself, uh, for us and for our salvation, the same in the last days, born from the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, as touching the manhood. Obviously she is not Theotokos, she's not the mother of the whole trinity. 
She's mother only of the divine word of God when he becomes flesh, when he becomes incarnate. As touching the matter, one and the same Christ, one and the same Christ, one and the same Son, one and the same Lord only begotten. All of this is against Nestorianism. To be acknowledged in two natures without confusion, this is a, to be acknowledged in two confusions, in two natures, that's against Eutyches, that's against monophysitism, um, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. Okay, this is, a, this is going back and bringing in the ancient tradition of so-called apophatic theology. That, that, in other words, the theology that, uh, that, 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 is, that is driven by the fact that, that the God, that God the Holy Trinity, is beyond all thought, all comprehension, all language. And so finally, all you can do is say what he's not. But you know, there's also cataphatic theology, positive theology. This, this is the theology that says what God is. And as I see it, the cataphatic theology, the positive theology, and the apophatic theology, the negative theology, saying what God is not, in order to kick the mind out of itself, it, they, 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 they work like two steps. So with the apophatic theology, you, you, you kick out of the mind any concept that it has of God. And then you turn around and you give cataphatic theology. So you give the mind something now uh, that it can walk with uh, in terms of what God is. So now the mind has something that God is. And you bring apophatic theology back. Now you kick that out of the mind. You bring cataphatic theology back and you bring something into the mind. And in this way, the mind is led step by step through negative, positive, negative, positive theology. Um, is led step by step, step out of itself and into a knowledge, as St. John Climacus might say, that is beyond knowing. A knowledge that, is, that knows in an unknowing way. Let's go on. So, the distinction of nature is being in no way abolished because of the union. They don't explain it. It's just an assertion. But rather the characteristic property of each nature being preserved and concurring into one person, and here they use the word prosopon, uh, the Latin persona, the English person, but then they go on to say, into one person and one hypostasis. Not as if Christ were parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son and only begotten God, Word, Lord Jesus Christ, even as the prophets from the beginning spoke concerning him, and our Lord Jesus Christ instructed us in the Creed of the Fathers. That would be the Nicene Creed, but it's now the Constant, it's now actually the Creed of Constantinople. It was formulated in 362 in Alexandria. But it would be called the Nicene Creed because the faith that was expressed in that creed at Constant in 362 of Alexandria and was confirmed by the Holy Fathers of the Second Ecumenical Council was, in, was, was Nicene in its theology. So they could call it the Nicene faith. Um, at the, from the beginning, spoke in our Lord Jesus Christ instructed us and the creed of the Fathers was handed down to us. Okay, just one last thing and then we were already, we're already, we're already late. You say that he comes together in one prosopon and one hypostasis. Look at that. Prosopon is the outer, is the outer face. The hypostasis is what's inside. It's that which stands underneath the whole shrine. So you see what they're saying, that Christ is one subject, both outside and inside. There's not just a mask that houses within itself two subjects. There are not two subjects. The one subject is the one hypostasis, the one subject that stands underneath. And by implication, that subject is the divine logos. So you hear what it's saying. There is no human hypostasis. There's a divine hypostasis. There is no human person. There's a divine person only. And that divine person, the, G, the, the logos of God, took to himself and himself became man. His body was his own. It was no one else's. It was his own. And this is the mystery. This is the mystery that philosophy cannot explain except by maybe used, uh, turning it into what, an avatar, maybe. But an avatar is not an incarnation of God, the Word. Well, for that matter, there's another, there's another, there's another theological issue here that's going to, that I'm going to talk about once we get done with this flyover that um, unsettles it just, it, 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 we'll see how it just threw, thing, it threw things up in the air from the get-go. It's the doctrine of creation. Um, so uh, um, we're dealing with we're dealing we're, we're dealing with theology, the theology of the Bible, seeking to sanctify and to illumine the mind of philosophy.
That's what we're doing. And can they do that without becoming snared by philosophy? But rather taking philosophy captive to theology. And so transforming philosophical understanding. All right, I get upstairs. And uh, worship the one Lord Jesus Christ.